know, growing up in Chicago, we lived near gang infested neighborhoods. To avoid the recruitment in such groups, we went to school and stayed home indulging in classic Genesis and NES media. Now, school was a major resource for us to retrieve games we never played before, and it was all thanks to my brother's popularity. He was and is still an excellent at winning friends and influencing people. Now, I personally wasn't so great at making friends, but my brother was a virgin in social life. Anyway, I benefited from his relationships. One of the perks of his relationships was that my brother would borrow games and comics from his friends even when we didn't have anything to exchange due to our impoverished situation. I learned early that if people like no are fond of you, they don't mind sharing their personal items with you. Around 1993, when we were in the fourth grade, my brother had this friend named Alberto, and Alberto had several issues in the Maximum Carnage Limited run that was released. The storyline was something I've ne never seen in a Spider-Man comic. It, it blew my mind. It was my introduction to Venom, who he was and why he hated Spider-Man so much. The killing and murders by psychopath Cletus Cassidy were more implied and off-frame than explicit. The story also introduced other D-list characters, D-list villains such as Shriek, Demo Goblin, Doppelganger, to name a few. Following that year, looking at the comics, my dad brought us Maximum Carnage on Sega Genesis Christmas of 1994. This really brought the comic to life for me and was quite the surprise as I didn't know that there was a Maximum Carnage video game. Well, what does this anecdote have to do with the world today? Within recent years, I revisited this story in graphic novel format. Being older, a tad bit more educated, and having a more mature perspective, seeing the world through a biblical lens, I tend to make connections to things, seeing parallels that were invisible to me before. And from comparing a Maximum Carnage story to our present day, including the pseudo-revolution we experienced in 2020, boy, do things start to get eerie. In the story, Shriek, Carnage's version of Harley Quinn to Joker, has the ability to manipulate sounds, harnessing it for, as Wikipedia puts it, destructive concussive force, or use it to disorient and agitate her enemies, which she did not hesitate to put Venom down in several panels of the comic. However, the more notable attribute of her powers is that she is able to channel her negative emotions and amplify those feelings in others around her, causing an implied form of mind control. This ability is central in watching how she bridles the insanity generated in the crowds to be even nuttier than she is. To her advantage, she causes people to fight each other, attack the good guys, and more disturbing, have people forego their moral responsibility to indulge in their darker, selfish instincts. In one panel, a woman was prone to throw her small children off the top of a building. Fortunately, Spider-Man comes in for the rescue before that happens. By partnering with Carnage, her powers to induce the psychotic are magnified times 10. She further explains how this works. I could take all these little bit bugs, negative thoughts and emotions crawling around inside my head and transmit them out to anyone close to me, like these charming citizens. Normally it just shakes them up a little, but since I've been hanging with Carnage and soaking up his sick vibes, I'm able to really pump up the volume. Carnage is the battery and I'm the radio. We can make anybody as crazy as we are. As a consequence, the citizens of NYC, already paranoid and on edge from media hysteria, are severely susceptible to her psionic waves, making them easy prey to manipulate their fears and causing rage and insanity. Parallel to the story, you could say our social media technology represents Shriek's psionic powers in our reality, as sites such as Facebook continues to engineer divisive content to be seen at escalates people's fears and biases while adding the insanity of commercial media to control the masses and we have a recipe for chaos. And with the emergence of TikTok carrying lunacy to a younger generation void of the ability to rightfully discern what's trash and what isn't, we can expect our descent into madness to occur quickly as today's kids become tomorrow's adults who are warmly welcoming a new world order. NYC was ill-equipped to battle Carnage and his cronies, placing them in a can't beat them join them conundrum. As behavior and education continues to become unrestrained, teachers and students with intentions to learn will eventually cave into campus insanity if there are no systems to counteract the tyranny from students allowed to run wild. I've worked on campuses where profanity was unchecked 
as it was looked upon as a battle not worth fighting. While I was able to manage it in my own room, zero tolerance for foul language and teaching students better ways to speak, it was not an easy procedure to mandate as students were able to speak unfiltered on the outside, opting to bridge it in on the inside. Oftentimes, I found myself being negatively impacted by the students' behavior having to use what they know to reach them while risking a change in my own character. When this happens, I know it is time to part ways with an institution. My educational experience in managing myself around the darkness the students bring with them is parallel to the prophet's experience in Sodom. This true life story is retold anecdotally by an unknown author who published a classic collection of devotionals. And it reads, as legend has it, a just and good man went to Sodom one day, hoping to save the city from God's judgment. He tried talking to first one individual and then the next, but nobody would engage in conversation with him. Next, he tried carrying a picket sign that had repent written on it in large letters. Nobody paid any attention to his sign after an initial glance. Finally, he began going from street to street and from marketplace to marketplace shouting loudly, Men and women, repent! What you were doing is wrong. It will kill you. It will destroy you. The people laughed at him, but still he went about shouting. One day, a person stopped him and said, Stranger, can't you see that your shouting is useless? The man replied, Yes, I see that. The person then asked, So why do you continue? The man then said, when I arrived in this city, I was convinced that I could change them. Now I continue shouting because I don't want them to change me. Though I am never at school shouting at students to repent, I can easily relate to what the mysterious prophet talks about in continuing his mission to prevent the city's darkness from overshadowing his light. We're to continue to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12 verse 2. Meditating on the word of God daily to combat mental and spiritual attacks. With the internal meditation to become equipped, we set ourselves up to sanctify ourselves among a world that continues to embrace sin. It is not in our interest to physically sanctify ourselves, withdrawing from society to remain pure, but be amongst the people to continue as a light to them. Matthew chapter 5 verse 14. If I did not have the Lord working on the inside of me to counteract such darkness, I would easily be consumed by it just like Shriek was able to do to the NYC citizens. The word helps me to capture the vain imaginations of my emotions, bringing them against biblical standard. What do you have to counter such darkness in your life, especially when we're entering a time of chaos? There is also a wonderful video Vadi Bachman delivers a message about how Paul doesn't allow the culture to taint him and his position for delivering the gospel. Paul's ministry is a perfect example of a man not fellowship with the world, yet being all things to all men that he might save some. I'll put a link in the description for that video as well. Revisiting Maximum Carnage allowed me to see parallels that were disturbing as fiction bleeds into reality. When marketing for the console version of this comics, there were ads in gaming magazines that headline paint the town red. If we continue down this path, there will be blood spilt to create entire crimson cities. Though it's prophesied in the book of Revelation and other books that these things must come to pass, I pray that if you're not a Christian or even if you are a Christian, that you do more than just accept the Lord Jesus Christ into your life and that you're just throwing, you're not throwing out random prayers such as God will provide and God will protect me that you're actually seeking him out and you're actually more so asking him, Lord, what would you have me to do? As we all have a part to play being co-laborers with the Lord in Jesus Christ. I pray that you've gotten something out of this video. God bless you guys for listening and I'll see you in the next one.